All right, so here's the surprise and late addition. Greg Hallinan is the assistant professor of astronomy at the California Institute of Technology. And his research group specializes in the construction of novel instruments and telescopes to tackle some of the big questions at the forefront of astrophysics. And I'm not going to talk too much about it because I really want to get as much time as we can with him. But let's tell you this. This August, Greg and his team heard something they like to say, go bump in the night. And we're really honored and thrilled to have Greg show up to tell you about this extraordinary discovery. Um, he is one of the most uh, currently in-demand scientists given, given this new event. And uh, because it's such a late edition, we didn't ask Greg to craft a talk. He's flying all over and talking everywhere. He was at MIT yesterday. But we wanted to get him out here, and we're just going to have a bit of a conversation. So please welcome Greg Hallinan. Hey, come on out here. Great. So, uh, can you guys keep my mic on? Fantastic. So, big question. What happened on August 17th, 2017? Okay. On that date, uh, gravitational wave detectors detected a new signal for the first time. The image shows uh, three gravitational wave detectors. The LIGO detectors in Hanford, uh, Washington. Uh, the LIGO detector in Livingston, uh, Louisiana and then the Virgo detector in Italy. These are three of the most sensitive instruments ever built. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and they detect gravitational waves, the very ripple in the fabric of space-time. They're so sensitive, they can detect the contraction and expansion of the Earth by the width of a single atom due to these ripples in space-time. And on August 17th, they detected for the first time the cosmic collision of two neutron stars. These are the two ultra-dense remnants of two giant stars that exploded billions of years ago. Since that time, they have spiraled each other, getting ever closer, and on August 17th, we detected their collision. What was very important about this was that collision produced an explosion, a fireball, which was the first time astronomers could actually detect signals with conventional normal telescopes. I have a quick video that shows uh, uh, the final death spiral of this event and the explosion. So this video, made by NASA, uh, shows the final death spiral, and as it, gets as it gets closer and closer, the gravitational waves get stronger and stronger before they collide in a massive explosion. You have this fireball that we see in optical and infrared, and you have an ultra-relativistic jet that we can see with gamma-ray telescopes and X-ray telescopes and radio telescopes. So when astronomers got the email saying there's been an event, we all knew it was go time, because there was going to be light. That's incredible. All right, so when the, when the waves were first detected, what happened next? Well, for me personally, uh, what, what normally happens, you get an email from LIGO saying there's been an event, okay? And that goes out to all the astronomers worldwide who are involved, so they get their telescopes trained as fast as they can. For me personally, I made a, a fatal miscalculation. On August 17, there was one week left before LIGO shuts down for a year for upgrades. It had been operating for nine months uh, with no detections. So with one week to go, I thought, what are the odds there'll be a detection in the last week? <laughs> so my wife and I took our baby daughter to Ireland, where I'm from, to meet our extended family for the first time. So when I got the email saying it's go time, I was standing in a grocery store <laughs> in the northwest of Ireland, holding a very jet-lagged baby, <laughs> And I get this email, and I'm like, oh, wow. And then I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm thousands of miles from where I need to be. Uh, and then my phone starts ringing, and my colleagues, Mansi Kazuyuala Caltech and Kunal Muli, were calling me to say, what do we do? What do we do? Let's get going. So like, everybody, like, like every other astronomer worldwide, we began planning. And that was the end of the vacation, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you and other scientists know where to look? It's a good question. So LIGO and Virgo told us the event happened in an area of the sky about 30 square degrees. Mm -hmm. That's still a pretty big area, about 100 times larger than, the, than the, uh, the full moon. So what astronomers did was look in that area of the sky. And it turns out in that area, there were about 49 galaxies that could have, or could be the, the site of the merger. So we began pointing our telescopes one by one to every galaxy, until finally we zoomed in on the right one. NGC 4993, at a distance of 130 million uh, light years away. And here 
is an image. On the left, you see a Hubble Space Telescope image from April 2017, before the detection. On the right, highlighted by the arrow, is the first detection of the explosion uh, from astronomers using the Swope Telescope of Carnegie Observatories. When first detected, it had the light of a billion suns. And afterwards, there was, there was uh, UV radiation, there was infrared, X-rays, and then for my, for my group, there was radio waves. Wow, fantastic. So, all right, so tell us, why is this such an important event? What does it mean for us? Good question. So the, fir the first thing, I mean, this, this is the first time we can actually detect gravitational waves yeah. and light simultaneously from an event. It's kind of like we're, we're, we're seeing and hearing the violet universe for the first time. Gravitational waves tell you about the dense environment uh, where the merger happens where well, you can see with telescopes. And then with our telescopes, we can see the explosion, learn what happened in the explosion, how much energy was there, and what elements were created there. Mm -hmm. The second, I think almost more exciting thing, is that it turns out in this explosion, there were 10,000 Earth masses of heavy elements created. That included 200 Earth masses worth of gold. And for those of you who are interested, uh, I checked the price of gold this morning. That is $50 million. That's 50. <laughs> with 30 zeros <laughs> afterwards, there were 500 Earth masses of platinum created. So to bring it all home, if you're wearing a ring in your finger that is gold or platinum or silver, it turns out that metal was created in the exact kind of same explosion as this billions of years ago before the Earth was formed. So you're wearing a bit of neutral star merger on your hand. <laughs> That's incredible. All right, so what do we learn from your team's discovery? So my team, uh, we discovered the radio waves. So when we had the email saying it's go time, uh, we began training all the radio telescopes we could worldwide towards the location of the, uh, of the signal. Uh, and it turns out we finally made the discovery with a very large array, which is the biggest, most sensitive radio telescope on the planet. It's in New Mexico. But it's actually managed by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory with headquarters right here in Charlottesville, which I think is kind of cool. So on the left is an optical image of this galaxy where you can see with the arrow again, you can see the location of the explosion. On the right, we have, if you had radio eyes, we have the radio discovery of this afterglow. And over the following weeks, it, 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 we, see, we saw it getting brighter and brighter. And that's very important. While everything else is fading away, the fireball is getting bigger and the radio is getting brighter. And we're going to learn so much. We're going to learn about the energy of the explosion. We're going to learn, was there a jet formed? We're going to learn what kind of environment did the explosion happen? Will there be stars formed there in the future and planets formed? And will the metals formed in this merger be part of the, uh, the formation of those planets? So we're going to learn an awful lot in the next year or so, I hope. Oh, that's fascinating. All right, so you told me something when we first talked two days ago about how you actually combine all of the power of these radio telescopes into something that assimilates an Earth-sized telescope. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure. So we use a very cool technique called very long baseline interferometry. And that involves combining multiple telescopes across the globe to create a mega telescope, an Earth-sized telescope. So here actually is a picture of some of the telescopes. We're using 38 telescopes across the continent and US and beyond, including the largest sing single steerable dish in the world in Green Bank, West Virginia. And we combine into this mega telescope. And why do we do that? Because it's more sensitive, but also because it's so large that it has, an, it has incredible spatial resolution. This telescope has resolution much better than the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. And it can actually resolve this fireball, this explosion. So we're hoping it, either this month or, the, or in the coming months, we'd be able to pr provide the very first snapshot image of a neutral star merger. Oh, that's incredible. All right, so let's go back to this thing about August 17th. From what I understand, these events they could take a long time to get to us, right? So when you say it happened on August 17th, the question in my mind is, is that actually the day it happened, or, or when did these stars collide? Right, so that's actually when the gravitational waves and light got here, okay? They've been traveling at the speed of light uh, since the merger. The speed of light is about 300,000 kilometers per second. It took 130 million years to get here. <laughs> and that's actually still a relatively nearby galaxy. Space is big. Almost harder to understand than cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what does the future hold? Like, what, what's next? So I mentioned LIGO getting shut down for upgrades. Uh -huh. It's going to come back online. It's going to be bigger and better and, and much more sensitive. So probably when it comes back online a year from now, we start seeing these events on a monthly basis. 
So we learn a lot more. We learn, you know, is it really where all the heavy metals come from? Uh, will we find closer events? Um, and eventually, when LIGO goes to another set of upgrades, we can see directly what happens afterwards. Do those neutron stars form black holes when they collide? Um, and you're also going to see a lot of really tired astronomers because <laughs> for this event, I haven't slept for two months. If they're happening on a monthly basis, I'm done. <laughs> so. All right, last question, because it's probably on everybody's mind. If this happened 130 million years ago and just got here, wh how, what are the odds that something like this actually happened, you know, another 50 million years ago, somewhere a little closer, and we're sort of a day away from being obliterated? <laughs> so. If, if, if one happened very nearby, huh? it could pose a threat. It, it, in <laughs> fact, if there was one happening nearby where the jet pointed right at us, it could actually take away the ozone layer. And mm -hmm. some theories suggest that maybe a mass extinction in the past might have been associated with an event like this. Mm -hmm. um, but we know the solar neighborhood pretty well, and it would have to be very nearby. So you can all relax. It's not going to happen. I, th I don't think there's any chance of us being you know, wiped out anytime soon. Yeah, Fantastic. All right, well, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you.